For Krima Media's quality, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is writer and columnist Ismail Lagardin to discuss his memoir titled Too White to be Colored, Too Colored to be Black. The title is, is a bit catchy, I must say. Can you briefly share how this title was decided? Hi, Sane. The title was decided basically because of the the overarching issue in the book, which is, if I can sum it up in a, a very simple way, is that when I was growing up in the in the colored townships of, uh, okay, let's just focus on El Dorado Park. You know, I spent much of my life in El Dorado Park and Clip Town and parts of Soweto. I was always abused and uh, persecuted and even sometimes violently because I, I have uh, very fair skin and green eyes, as, as you can probably tell. Uh, so there were times when I, uh, when I got good marks at school or when I did well, my peers, the other school kids would always beat me up and say that I only got good marks because the teacher likes me because I have green eyes. So that persecution, you know, it was quite serious. And, and, and I, I discovered subsequently um, after writing the book, the enduring effects of that because you, you continue to to second guess yourself, you continue to, to feel insecure about anything you might achieve. So, so the second part to, to color to be black is, you know, I, I went, I went walk about and, and came home with a, with a PhD and I've done all sorts of things. And I immediately am faced again with, uh, I'm being told uh, I'm not an African um, and Africa belongs to the Africans. I worked on the National Planning Commission for a, a period of what, when we prepared it. And I remember going to um, speak to public servants around the country, um, the various form, levels of government. And whenever I walked into a, a meeting to, to give a presentation, give a talk on the NDP, people would always whisper, um, not realizing I understand some vernacular. Uh, they would under, always say, is this guy white or is he colored? So. Uh, you know, and, and then I was told by a professor at um, Stellenbosch University that uh, I'm not black enough to get a job. He said, I don't meet the diversity requirements. And this was a, one, a white man who told me this. And at UCT, a professor also told me that they would, you know, rather employ a real African than a colored. So, you know, that sums up the title, but it's a lot more nuanced and a lot more complex than that. Mm -hmm. I also like felt a bit uh, sad when I read in the book, but we'll just leave uh, for the readers uh, to find out for themselves where now another Lena uh, was a bit jealous and she went as far as hitting you because now a teacher had told you to read a poem in class. And yeah. You were yeah. a, a favorite. Yeah, but it was a bit yeah. So are those traumatic uh, incidents uh, the real reasons why you ended up not uh, liking your, your skin, uh, you were longing yeah. to be black, you say in yeah. the, for political yeah. and social reasons. Yeah, well, well, you know, the thing is about, the thing is, is if you, uh, you know, in my family, um, if you just take my immediate family in the range of family, I, I think I'm probably the, the, the whitest, the greenest eyes, and I always wanted to darker skin only because, you know, because of all the persecution, you know, I got beaten up several times, but the one that stands out is of this one um, fellow student who beat me up and she had a few guys hold me down while she kicked me and punched me. I was only 12 or 13, but it continued for a long time. And there were, the readers can, will also find out some of the, the, the worst things that happened to me because of that. So there was this constant harassment over the color of my skin. And I think, you know, although the book is essentially a hybrid memoir, um, I always insist that, you know, I'm not an interesting person, but I have lived in interesting times in the sense that it, it, this is not just my story. It is a story of us as a society and all the problems that we've caused. I think before the before we went online, I, I mentioned just briefly that one of the successes of apartheid is it's kept us apart. So, you know, and 
So as a so-called colored person, I can't speak as Zulu, Sivanda, Sepedi, and they, they've successfully kept us apart. And so, so all that is what made me really feel that, you know, as a South African and, and with my fellow South Africans, you know, we've become so obsessed with colorism, even in the colored community where there's a lot of racism or, you know, and so, so those are all the things that I try to deal with in, in the book. And in the book, uh, you also remember with a regret, a picture now that you took of, of Jackie Quinn and Leon Mayer who were assassinated during yeah. the apartheid uh, era. Can you tell us about this painful episode? I think that it was, it was painful to photograph that on, on several levels. The one was the physical act of taking the picture requires you to, to switch off uh, internally and not to feel anything. So I remember seeing the two, body, the two bodies lying side by side. I think it was on the kitchen floor. And I, I, as I walked in, I looked at it and I had to walk out of the house again. And as I walked out, uh, I just, I remember just exhaling and inhaling the Lesotho air and just switching my mind off literally and just walking straight back in and I stepped over their bodies and I pointed the camera into their faces and I shot the camera and I walked out again. And, it, you know, it, it is just of these two faces of, 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 of two, the two dead people, one face facing this way and the other facing that way. And I captured it. It just made me realize after the many years later, as I, I wrote in the book, just how intrusive and how voyeuristic photography, news photography and press photography is. But that was a, um, it was very traumatic. But, you know, I, before I, I, I claim this massive trauma, we just remember that they had a one-year-old child who was left without parents and the family. And so the trauma was for them. And this is just my very small experience, but it was a very difficult um, thing even today. But the interesting thing about that photograph is, I had uh, forgotten about that photograph. I, I, I didn't forget about the incident. I didn't forget about the t time. I, it was always in the back of my mind. But a few years ago, a, a friend uh, or a colleague, a very smart person, um, got hold of me and said she had been trying to locate the person who took the photograph. And, um, you know, my name is sometimes spelled very, very strangely and even pronounced very strangely um, in, in Europe and North America, and even in South Africa, people refer to it as La Guardian. And I have stopped bothering correcting people, but so it's often considered French or something else. And, and I just, you know, I stopped caring. And she said she finally found this. And apparently, and I hope I get this right now, um, the, the photograph was so graphic and it was so painful to watch that they, when, they put, when it was on display, it was placed behind a screen to tell people, look, this is a very horrific picture. It may, might be, bring back memories. So, you know, please look, you can, you can look at it at your, own, at your own discretion. That was, an, I think, an important photograph, but it was important for so many reasons, for photography, personally, and for the families, as well as, you know, just the dangerous time we were living in, because it was December 1985 when the SAE, SADF would have these raids into neighboring countries and, and kill so-called terrorists. So that was the significance overall of that photograph. And in the same year, again in 1985, you were also exposed into an incident uh, at Vet University when uh, Feroz uh, Kachale yeah. was also beaten by the police. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, about that day? Well, that was an interesting day because the, there were two things that stood out in that day. The first was uh, Faroz Kachalia's uh, speech uh, on the library lawn. And uh, I was actually sitting on the library lawn uh, next to a man with a, a, a floral shirt. I think it was a white and pink floral shirt. And he, he carried a briefcase with him and it, it didn't seem anything unusual. And then as the meeting ended, uh, or I think the, the group were going to march into Brownfontein, this man, 
turned out to be a, a, an undercover police uh, officer, policeman. And he and a, uh, a uniformed policeman then marched Feroz Kachalia out and I took the photograph. And um, the photograph um, was one thing and it, it, it stands out and it's, it's actually, it's there on my wall as uh, if, you, if you can see. And, but the other thing was I noticed two photographers at the time who were part of the national party support media sharing information with the police and sharing pictures and and giving details of activists and i was really shocked by that because you know people have sort of one of those photographers has been lionized and he's been admired and he was a great photographer there's no question about it but he was seen as some kind of a hero in, in the Bang Bang Club. And, you know, we, we couldn't, I, I don't think I could afford to be, to, 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 be, to, to dramatize my own role as a, a reporter or as a photojournalist, because it was my community that was under attack. So those are the two things that stood out uh, on that day. I think it was August uh, 1985 and the Weekly Mail, we had just started the week well not me but we had we the weekly mail had just been started and i was one of the first people who worked for it so that's those are two very interesting things the lesotho picture was uh well i, I was a stringer for the sunday tribune and that's how i paid my my rent you had your own fair share now of being a uh, brutally attacked if i may say so by the police and you were arrested at john foster square can you yeah. say why uh, you were beaten, and what happened to you after this? There were a couple of incidents of of being arrested and detained, and and the, but the one I, you know, and I, I, the reason why I don't bring it all up is because so many people were 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 treated, uh, were arrested and beaten up, and uh, so I didn't want to seem to be the only one who made a big deal of it. But the one incident I did raise in the book is. It's actually funny now. M many people claim to have been part of the liberation movement or they did something brave or courageous. And I just didn't do any of that. I, I was just a journalist. So I don't want to boast about things or boast that, you know, I was in detention. So therefore I, I have credibility. I joke about it now, but it was exceptionally painful because when they had me tied up and, and, held, and hung up by my hands, both my shoulders popped out of their sockets and I wet myself from the pain and I, I passed out. So that was, um, that was that experience. It's a small incident compared to the suffering of very many people. So I didn't want to bring up all the other issues. That one just stood out as, as something a bit humorous and, and a bit telling about how they attacked the press and how they treated us. You were also even told by a professor that you were not black enough at diversity. How does that make you feel? Because the country is still dealing with issues of racism in 2022. You know, that was at Stellenbosch University. And then later I became uh, the executive dean of business and economic uh, sciences at, at Nelson Mandela University. Now, mm -hmm. I am bound by a confidentiality agreement and I can't explain to you the mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the circumstances that led to my, my resignation. I can't talk about that. So let me talk about the Stellenbosch thing. The Stellenbosch thing was interesting because um, the, the, the professor, I have his emails, I still, I've still got the email, basically told me that I, I didn't meet the diversity requirements. But then in the same breath, he said to me, oh, you are that critical political economist, uh, you know, and uh, would you mind coming to give a class and lead a seminar discussion on X, Y, and Z? And I thought to myself, this is really funny because they they won't employ me because I'm not white uh, black enough, but they really like my mind. So I went and gave this uh, lecture, and um, the students until today, there are students from Europe who who stay in touch with me and and tell me that the two hours or three hours I spent with them were the best time they had at university in two or three years, and and uh, you know local people also were impressed by it. So it 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 was upsetting. But I wasn't hurt. I just, you know, I said, you know, I told myself, and, you know, what do you do? Do you, you know, so we're still struggling with those issues. But mm -hmm. my basic point is that, a, you know, I don't hate white people and I will mm -hmm. always stand up for African women. And mm -hmm. that I can't say more.
And if you can just briefly uh, wrap up uh, for our viewers, what else uh, will they find if they were to buy your book? I, I'm going to say this. Um, there was an, uh, uh, Chris Roper from Business, uh, from the Financial Mail reviewed the book. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded by exactly how much Chris got the book. Mm -hmm. And it was insightful. His, his review actually taught me a lot more about the book than, than the book itself. Um, but I think what I'm hoping people would find is, is what I discovered two months after the book. Two months after I read the book, I realized why I had failed in so many areas in relationships, in various things. It's because I always second guess myself or I always doubt myself. Because if you've been told your whole life, Ugh, you're only doing well because you have green eyes, then every time you do something, you wonder, wow, am I, am I just achieving this because of, not because I'm really smart or because I'm good or anything, it's because of this. So I, I think in the book, I get to the London School of Economics and, and I'm told that uh, the amount of students at the top 5% univer of universities around the world get to places like London School of Economics and, and, and Oxford. And I think to myself, then, then how did I get here? Mm. I'm just a colored from El Dorado Park. That was Ismail Lacartin discussing his book titled Too White to be Colored, Too Colored to be Black.